Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for our East Coast Friends Afternoon. For anyone joining us in different time zones, good morning to all of you. We'll give you just a little bit of time for everyone to come into the webinar and then we'll get started. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking about cultivating and sustaining Title IX advisors. You will all be muted upon your entry to the webinar. So just wanna make sure we have that logistic in mind. If you could submit all of your questions to the Q&A box, that would be great. Um, in addition to any questions that you have, if you have things that are working at your school or suggestions, um, things that, that you think would be helpful for the greater group to hear, you know, please type those into the Q&A box as well. Um, so we can make this as, as interactive as possible so we can all learn from one another. Wanted to let you know as well that the webinar is being recorded and it will be distributed after we are done today. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, my name is Ashling Earhart. I'm the chair of the Title IX practice group at Cohen Seglius. I'm an attorney and I am trained as a Title IX investigator as well as a decision maker for Title IX hearings. I'm hired by colleges and universities as well as the parties themselves to serve as an advisor to parties in Title IX investigative processes across the country. Um, I conduct trainings for colleges and university, sometimes for boards of trustees, really for anyone the college wants to instruct um, on all things Title IX. I've also review and revise schools policies to ensure their compliance with the regulations and that they make sense for the culture of that particular school. Sydney or Allison, you wanna jump in? Sure, I'll go ahead really quickly. Um, hi, my name is Sydney smith Forecare. I'm an associate working in the Title IX group at Cohen Seglius with Ashling, and I also both um, am a certified investigator working with universities, and I also am at times an advisor for parties in Title IX matters. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Wisniewski. I am the Campus Dean of Students and Title IX Coordinator at Rutgers University in Camden. Um, and I'm part of the panel today to provide a bit of a uh, practical uh, experience to Title IX and what it means to work with advisors. Thanks everyone for coming today. So we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth as we go on about how to select, train and keep advisors. But where we wanted to start is with the statute that outlines um, what is expected of universities regarding how they um, do these things. So the important parts of this large chunk of text are that all the parties should be given the opportunity to be accompanied to any related meeting or proceeding by an advisor of their choice and the university should not limit the choice or the presence of the advisor for either party. Um, and that's for any meeting or any grievance proceeding throughout this process. Um, as you'll see in there as well, um, the advisor may be an attorney, but they may be someone else. We'll talk to you later about how to select um, when certain types of advisors may be more appropriate um, and how this all goes into play in the real world. Speaking of the real world, Allison, will you bring us to the real world and talk to us about selecting advisors? Yes, thank you so much, Ash. Okay, um, so one of the things that I always do is like, okay, we need help with Title IX. Advisors are critical to the success of the case um, so that we can make sure that one, we're meeting what the um, reg said, uh, but also to ensure that the process goes as smoothly as possible. Um, knowing that Title IX is a very emotional situation, um, there's emotions on both sides. And sometimes when you're dealing with policy, emotions take over. And so the advisor is really to help the student uh, sort of stay in line and understand what the policy is. Um, and also to pose questions to help them understand um, as they're moving through the process prior to hearing what, what is going to be expected of them. 
Um, so the first thing I say to everyone is look at your own institutional policy because there may be differences in there um, specific to who you're using for advisors. Um, you know, if it's faculty, staff, is it an outside council? When those things are um, to be changed could be different at, at every institution. For today's purposes, I'll talk a lot about my experience here at a public um, institution and what we're doing, um, but that may be different. And so, you know, if there's other things that you're, you use and best practices, you know, drop, drop them in the chat so that we can all sort of benefit from them. Um, very important when you're thinking about who to choose is to also understand your student base. Um, and so your advisors should look similar to what your student um, uh, demographics are on your, on your campuses. Um, and the other thing I get all the time is like, how many? Um, look at your past caseload, times it by two, and that should be a good starting point. And, um, and I say that because um, there's going to be a couple of times where there could be a conflict of interest. There could be um, personal time that they that the advisor may not be able to participate. Um, there could be a, multiple cases going on and you may need to, um, you know, have different folks doing that. So, you know, thinking about your caseload, thinking about the demographics of your students and how that should be reflected in your advisors. Um, and then also this idea of your advisors need to understand that they are going to be given very, very personal information on a student that is unlike any other information that they may have seen. And so what does that mean? We don't want them sharing this outside of their role. Um, and so that confidentiality word is there. Um, I spend a lot of time on that with folks that want to volunteer to be advisors because it is very, very important that the student's story remains their story. Um, and that that narrative is part of, um, you know, the Title IX process and not outside there. So making sure that they're able to sort of uphold what confidentiality means um, within your policy. Um, the other kind of idea of advisors is if you have a graduate or law um, school or you might have a social work school with graduate students, they are a great uh, kind of pool for you if your policy allows you to use students. So again, I'm always going to say go back to your institutional policy and make sure. But um, for instance, there, within the law school, there could be a pro bono clinic. This could be a great opportunity for them to sort of work on, on a case together all the way through hearing. Um, for faculty and staff, um, specifically staff, if they are aligned, um, we need to make sure that their managers are approving their time outside of the office and their daily work so that they can um, work on this. And there's oftentimes I'm asked, well, how, how much time are they going to be out? And well, as you all know, Title IX cases sometimes are resolved very quickly and other times they're not. So it's a hard um, question to an answer, but to be as realistic as possible. Um, because these these things are not just at the hearing. You want your advisor to be part of the process from, from the beginning when you're starting to meet with the student onward um, so that they have someone in the room with them that really understands the policy. Um, the other thing is this idea of making partnerships across uh, your campus. Um, many of you also sort of do kind of drop-in meetings at department chair level or at a specific staff meeting um, of a specific department, or you may go to like an SGA meeting or, or something like this just to do an overview of Title IX. That is a perfect opportunity to talk about how people can get involved in the process and also sort of give back. And so at, at those meetings, talk about it. I have, you know, we need advisors to help us with these. This is what an advisor's role is. Um, and then follow up with people. There's there's uh, oftentimes people want to on cam college campuses want to be involved um, and they just don't know how. And so that's a, a great idea um, to talk about that. A lot of times I'll talk with advisors and ask them, well, why did you really want to do this? Uh, and their answers tend to be, I want to give back. Um, something traumatic happened to me and I want to make sure that someone is with somebody. Right. I've heard that a couple of times. Um, or they just want to help students, and this is their their way to do so. Um, so that's kind of that piece. Um, this the selecting of the advisors also kind of goes into well, what is it in for me, right? Um, we at a public institution we don't pay or provide um, additional like financial benefits to um, advisors. I have heard some schools doing that, so there's not that 
you know, money part of this. Um, but it is a lot on the, you're doing really good work and our, our policy needs you to be part of it. So to be able to articulate that to uh, potential volunteers would be great. Um, other things like certifications or attending trainings or really um, maybe doing special events, uh, there are all types of things that you can sort of add to make it a little bit more exciting for someone to uh, volunteer to do this, this work. Um, there is a there should be an application process because again you want the folks to say yep I understand that this is going to be a time commitment yes I understand I need to go to training um, you know all that kind of thing on our campus what we've been doing is asking for at least a year to two years of a commitment um, and for us that makes sense because of the amount of training that we're giving um, our advisors. And so we want to be able to have that consistent group of advisors for our students and, and the training then happens. Um, a, a couple of years back, we moved to a selection process where we did mid-year. Um, and so it was outside of when we would typically do things on a college campus, right? Like most of us are like, okay, beginning of the fall semester, let's start all of our programming. Um, that was like super overwhelming when we were doing other training and hitting other requirements. And so we moved that to the middle of the fall for recruitment with training happening over break and then the new advisor list being released in the spring for a full year. Um, and that has been very beneficial to us because then what we do is kind of bring folks together um, and have subsequent training around, you know, it, any issues with policy or some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, so I would suggest that you kind of look at, again, look at your policy, look at your student uh, base and what you're seeing in your caseloads and, and what makes the most sense for you. Allison, you mentioned an application process. I mean, what does that look like? Is that your job as Title IX coordinator? Are you looking at those applications and saying yes or no? I mean, what's what's kind of the standard there for, for approving or denying an application? Sure. Um, so we have a joint um, process with our uh, conduct office. Um, and so together with our director of our conduct, uh, we review them. Um, and we're just making sure that, uh, you know, folks can meet those time commitments and that they're willing to, you know, adhere and understand the policies. Um, yeah. And it's it's easy. We we do a Qualtrics form. You fill it out. We then review. We, you know, say, are you sure? If it's a staff member that may need additional approval from management, we ask them to get that in writing and then that that's added. It's a pretty and quick period. I know you have a lot of unions on campus. Are there any union concerns that you have as far as people advising and serving as advisors and getting that approval? Yeah, there are. Um, and we've been able to sort of to navigate that by talking with the unions. Um, and so that's another thing for institutions. If you are going to be working um, and having your volunteers out of the union, talk with them directly about that. Um, we have sort of switched and put that on um, the staff member to get all the approvals through their management for that. Okay. And if you're at an institution, you know, and, and you hear something that you like today, but you say, oh, you know, our policy doesn't allow for that policies change. You can implement change in your own policies. So if you don't allow law students to serve as advisors currently, think about it. I mean, it's a great pool, as Allison said, from which to draw. And it, it's a great source of, of potential advisors, you know, for you on campus. So training advisors, um, how to go about it. There are, you know, two different ways. And I'd even throw in a third, a hybrid between these two. So you could do everything in-house. Um, the benefit of that would be, you know, you're you're tailoring that training to your school and to your school's policy, to the culture of your school. What works for you? Are you, you know, a small private school? Are you a huge state school with 100,000 students? You know, that really is going to play a role. Um, who's going to conduct that training? Is it going to be general counsel? Is it going to be the Title IX coordinator, a combination of both? Are you going to bring in an external attorney who's familiar with your school's policy that can really, you know, to walk these, these volunteers through and, and best prepare them to become advisors? Another option is that you can, you know, send your potential advisors to training. So there are a lot of different organizations that through which you could do that. So we have a TICSA and NASPA, um, the American College Personnel Association. These are, you know, just three of the ones um, that are used a lot to get people trained. 
um, you could do a combination of both, which I think is actually, you know, a, a great option for schools. So you could, you know, send your future advisors to training at a TIXA, for example, um, but then, you know, have a, a more, you know, familiar laid back kind of training that's definitely more specific to your school and to the needs of your school. And there are so many benefits of that. That's, it's just a more intimate and more, you know, I think effective you get the advisors, they, they start to know one another. And it's important for that network of people to, you know, become familiar with one another and lean on each other for support when they're going through these Title IX processes as well. Um, the best, how best to do this? How often do you do it? It's a, it's a big question. Um, definitely yearly, you want your advisors to be trained. Um, but you also want to, you, you don't want to just train them and kind of leave them um, without any, you know, recourse or for how, how to answer questions, you know, quickly. Um, you want to have semester meetings to review the policy, um, to go over trends. Have, have there been any policy changes? I know we're all waiting for uh, the new regs to drop. That's going to involve so many different policy uh, revisions. So, you know, these are the things that you want to be in contact with your advisors about um, so that they're very knowledgeable about what's going on. If you have a particular trend on campus, you want them to know that too, um, so that they're, they're in the know. You want to really just have those consistent check-ins with your advisors so that they are, um, you know, feeling a part of the process and feeling well able to be able to address parties' concerns while they're walking the parties through the Title IX process. So training has to include so many different things. So I'm going to break each one of these down. Um, and, you know, Allison really harped on policies and procedures. I mean, that that's the name of the game. That that Those advisors really need to be up to speed um, on your particular institution's policies and procedures and what that looks like. They are the person that the party is going to go to to get those questions answered. So the Title IX coordinator, of course, is always available to answer those questions. But the reality is, as an advisor, that advisor is going to, you know, create a special relationship with the party um, and, the, and going to lean on that advisor to get answers. You know, what's next? What to expect? What's the time frame? What do I need to prepare for? So all of those questions can be asked and answered by the advisor, but the advisor first needs to know what to expect, um, you know, based upon what the policy sets forth. We talked a little bit about just making sure that, you know, your advisors are aware of, of any changes to the policy. So you don't want to train them and just kind of leave them hanging then. Um, they need to know, especially if it affects time frame for an investigation or, or something that will affect the party. So the advisors, your institution needs to also prepare the advisors for meeting the party for the first time. Talk about that first meeting, you know, discuss whether that meeting is going to be virtual. Is it going to be in person? Talk about the location of that first meeting. Should it be on campus, off campus? Will it be in the Title IX office? Do, P do students know that when someone's walking into the Title IX office, they're there to either report or to be, you know, accused of, of allegations? Maybe you want your school has a room that's private, um, that it allows for, you know, open and honest dialogue between the party and the advisor for that first meeting or any subsequent meetings. If the room is, you know, only semi-private and the walls are thin, I've been in this situation too, you know, talk about bringing a noise machine. Um, so that people in, in the room beside you aren't going to hear the delicate and confidential nature of that discussion. You know, does the room have tissues? Is there water? I mean, these are all the nitty gritty things that, you know, as an advisor, you need to be thinking about and discussing with these advisors um, so that they're best prepared for that first meeting so that it's going to go well and that the party is going to really feel safe and confident in that advisor that you have assigned to them. A big part of, of an advisor's role is, you know, establishing appropriate boundaries. And as part of the training that you'll provide to your advisors, you really need to talk about, you know, the importance of establishing those appropriate boundaries. You know, how are they going to communicate? Is it going to be by email? Is it going to be phone, work phone, cell phone? Do you expect advisors to give out a personal cell phone for texts and calls at all hours of the day and night? The, the point is that the advisor really needs to define that line 
um, you know, between advisor and therapist, right? So the advisor needs to ensure that the party is, is getting any professional mental health help that the party needs um, and remind the party that that's not the advisor's role. Um, so that, that, that really is a big part of, of what the training should involve as well. Prepare your advisors for what will be expected of them while attending meetings, as well as any interview or follow-up interview. That, this is a really important part of the advisor's role. Um, the party may want to meet with the advisor to do a mock interview before that initial interview. So talk to your, you know, talk to your advisors, what's expected of them, what should they be doing? Um, what do they think is a good, good idea to be doing? Your party may be nervous and prefer to write out a statement and read that at the initial interview. Does your school allow this? Again, these are all the things that, that you need to be talking about with your advisors um, so that they're prepared. When they're actually in the meeting or in the interview, should they be taking notes? Should they be potted plants, unable to speak at all? Um, you need to inform them again, what to expect, what they should be doing so that they can be of best assistance to that party. As we all know, each investigator assigned to a particular Title IX investigation is different. So some investigators will meet with a party and then provide a draft summary of that interview shortly after the interview is completed. Um, so for investigators who do that, you know, you, you want your advisors to be aware that this is possible. Um, the party usually has a certain period of time, seven or 10 days to respond to just that interview summary of theirs and provide any comments. So again, what do you expect of your advisors for that process? Um, do they make their own revisions, you know, based upon any notes that they took during the interview? Do they only review any revisions that the party first suggests? You know, again, walk them through what does that look like at, at your school and, and what does their common sense tell them that they should, should be doing during that process? Other investigators don't provide draft summaries of individual interviews and they prefer to, prefer to wait and send the draft investigative report all at once. This draft report can be extensive. You know, I've seen draft reports in the thousands of pages between the report as well as the exhibits. So, and usually there's a short time frame, you know, to review that and provide comments on it, especially when it's a very lengthy report. So if the investigator sends out the draft report and the advisor's on vacation for the entirety of that review period, that's a big problem. So again, you want to you, you want to address any potential issue like that before assigning that advisor um, to serve in that capacity. Of the draft report, you know, your training should tell them what is expected of them as far as any review or any revisions that they are going to be making. Once that report is finalized, they will also receive a copy of that, the party and the advisor. The advisors are are responsible for reading through the entirety of that report, no matter how long it is, and to become very familiar with its contents. And why is that? Why do they have to be so familiar with this final investigative report? Because they are the ones who conduct the cross-examination at the hearing. I mean, this is the key role um, that's part of the current regs that is placed upon the shoulders of advisors. Um, you know, you could have your own whole day training on how to do this, um, because it, it's such an important part of the actual hearing. Um, and it's such a difficult thing for people who aren't trained to conduct cross-examination. Um, for example, lawyers, it's difficult for people. It's an art to learn for sure. So this should be a very important part of any training that you're offering to your advisors. Also need to train them on what to expect for the hearing. Their role is crucial during it. Um, outside of the cross-examination, what else should they be doing? How else should they pre be preparing that party for the hearing? Um, should they be conducting you know, mock Q&A, mock cross-examination questions? Again, these are all of the things that you want to be thinking about, what works best for your school, and what you expect of your advisors during that process. The things I've been thinking or ha have been speaking about until now really revolve around the formal process and getting to a hearing. Um, supportive measures, though, this is key. I mean, so important for the party, um, you know, whether they're going for through the formal or informal process. 
Um, sometimes when a party meets with the Title IX coordinator for the first time, you know, they're just hearing this term supportive measures for the first time and may not really understand what the term means. So during the course of an, an investigation, it may be the advisor that says, you know, I really think that you need X supportive measure or the party may say to the advisor, I'm really struggling in a class and I wish I could just have additional time for this assignment. Uh, you know, that advisor is, is key to, to, you know, reminding the party to say, listen, you have the ability to ask for supportive measures. Here's what you need to do um, to be able to get those. So that's really, you know, another important aspect of how your advisors should be trained. Um, there's also the potential for informal resolution. Um, this is, you know, outside, sometimes during the formal process, parties will get to the, the finish line almost and then decide that they want to informally resolve the process. I have found in my experience that advisors, when there, there are advisors on both sides for the complainant and the respondent, um, that those advisors really do play a key role um, in making that informal resolution happen because parties are hesitant. You know, they don't, sometimes there's a no contact order in place oftentimes, and they don't want to, you know, have to deal with the other party directly. And this is where the advisors come in um, and can make suggestions. Um, they, can, they can work with the other party's advisor and, and try to get an informal resolution done if that's what both parties want to do. Um, I've seen it, you know, in cases that have gone on for years that I never thought would informally resolve, you know, they do, you know, it was the effort of just reaching out to the other person's uh, advisor, um, keeping up communications with that advisor, um, you know, how, how, you, how you're expressing, you know, the party's interest in, in resolving that informally, that really can make um, that happen. If the case does go through a hearing and there is an appeal process, you know, what does your school ex expect, if anything, of the advisor to do for that appeal? Um, so again, these are all of the questions that you need to be thinking about when you're, you're planning a training for your advisors on campus. So You've done this extensive training. You have a panel of advisors that are ready to go to help the parties at your institution. How are you going about assigning them? What are the best practices? So typically at most institutions, your Title IX coordinator will be doing this, but you may have a deputy coordinator or another delegated person who essentially keeps the list of advisors and stays updated on who is available and who can be assigned. Uh, that's something you just want to make sure is very clear so that way that list is being up kept. Um, when a party comes to you and says, I want an advisor, or a party doesn't have an advisor and you're wanting to advise them on getting an advisor, uh, there's a few ways you can do it. One option is to give the list over to the parties and say, look into these people and let us know if you have any interest in any of them or who your preference would be. And we will, the Title IX office, reach out on your behalf. Another option is to take what you know about the um, party, whether it's their um, the facts in their matter, their um, gender preference, their background, and think about who would align well with that within your experience. That may be um, a group of advisors that you give to them to look over and think about, or it may be you give them a single suggestion, see what they say. And then of course you can go from there if another one is needed. It is important to think about um, the Title IX office doing that outreach though, uh, because there is a potential of course that an advisor may not be uh, available. Would you want the student to have to come back to your office after they've been told that by the advisor directly, or would you like your office to be the ones handling that? That's something you need to decide. And Allison, how does that work, you know, at Rutgers, you know, practically speaking? I mean, do you have a group of advisors that you feel most comfortable with if it's a, you know, a case that's a big case or, you know, you feel like a particular advisor would work well with a particular student? Yeah, we've actually done it uh, both ways. Uh, but I do allow um, the student to take a look at the full list to see if there's a natural connection. Um, and then from there we'll do. Um, I will say that it's 
probably better for your Title IX, either coordinator or office, to do the outreach to the advisor to make sure that for the time commitment and what you think um, is going to happen, then having the student kind of be told, no, I can't do this, when they're already going through a traumatic um, experience. Mm -hmm. It's a great point. Right, absolutely. Well, and another thing to keep in mind that you don't want the student to be the one uh, told is if there's a conflict. You want to give the opportunity for the advisor to let you know why they can't serve in a particular case. Maybe they know one of the parties, maybe they um, have background knowledge of the matter and they don't feel comfortable being an advisor. Any of those situations, you want to have the advisor um, directly commenting to the Title IX office. You don't want the student to be told that whenever they're already, like Allison said, going through trauma and having to face that would be an additional um, negative experience potentially. You also want to be cognizant of what the time commitments are for that advisor. Are they already advising another student or even another couple or few students? Um, it may be that your university outlines how many cases a particular advisor can um, work on, on a at a time. And that can be personalized, right? You may have advisors who have less time who say, I only want to do one at a time or even one a year, one a semester. But you also may have other advisors who are willing to work on a couple of cases at a time or may be more willing to do um, a rolling assignment where when one case ends, they're willing to immediately take on another one. That's something that you'll want to just keep track of. So that way you can accurately advise your students on who is available. With that advising, we recommend, if you haven't been able to tell, um, like a dynamic list situation where you're keeping track of who's available, what their commitments are. And with that would also come things like vacations, sabbaticals, large scale commitments. Obviously, you're not going to know everything going on in the advisor's lives, but being able to track things, especially extended periods of time away like sabbaticals, will be really helpful whenever you're assigning advisors. You don't want to reach out to someone and have a student go a long period of time without hearing from an advisor or being assigned an advisor because you're waiting on someone that happens to be on sabbatical to get back to you. Being um, Encouraging your advisors to let you know um, when you train them what their time periods away will look like will be helpful for you on the back end whenever you're looking at who may be available to be assigned to a matter. Um, and be very upfront with how large scale the commitment is, right? If there's this, someone that's currently advising another student and they say, well, maybe I could take this on, be upfront with them about what you think the actual commitment will be. Don't um, downplay it to get them to agree. You want them to be able to give their time to every case that they're an advisor on um, as much as they are able to. So it would be a disservice to um, to downplay it in a way that would keep them from being able to give the time necessary. Sometimes you may have a case or a matter where you've got a couple, a, a party looking for an advisor, and you think maybe the people on your normal list are not the best fit. Maybe it makes more sense to outsource to an attorney. This can happen um, in a few different ways and a few different reasons, and it really is up to your university policy. I know some universities, whenever one party has an attorney that they've brought as their advisor of choice, um, some universities will appoint an advisor for the other party, so there's not an inequality between the parties um, there, especially whenever you have matters that go to a full hearing, it may be um, that there is some inequality if one person is being advised by a family or friend that has no background in Title IX, no background in cross-examination or hearings like that, and one person has an attorney. So that's something you'll want to think about, whether that's something your university can do, whether that's something you want to have put in your policies. Talk to your general counsel and whoever the administrator is over Title IX at your university to see what makes sense in your situation. This may also occur for cases that have, we're calling it particular notoriety, but that can mean different things. Do you have a case that is getting press on your campus? Or do you have a case where there's lots of students aware of the case and the results will be spread outside of just those two people involved in the matter? That may be a case or a matter, a Title IX case where you decide maybe we want attorneys involved, maybe we want to have um, some outside help for advising. Um, there can be other concerns as well. Maybe the allegations are um, unusually severe. Maybe you would like to have an attorney involved in those situations. 
One thing that should be clear, though, is that you outline this with your policy and with your office ahead of time. You don't want to be having to come up on the fly on a case by case basis every single time. It's good um, to have an idea of when you would be looking to appoint an attorney and when you would not be. And of course, there are cases that are going to be outliers that will come up. But having that guideline from the beginning can help you better advise your parties and have a more streamlined process when you are appointing your advisors. So as we know, under the regs, the parties are allowed to choose their advisor. Um, and some parties allow for both, you know, a support person as well as an official advisor as defined by the regs. And I, I feel like, you know, that really is the best of both worlds because the support person is more the emotional support person for that person. It's a mom, a dad, a friend, a roommate, um, someone that they really feel comfortable with and already have a pre-existing relationship with. Um, and then the advisor is the person who really, you know, knows the policy and walks the person through, um, you know, that particular school's Title IX investigation and what it looks like. So to me, that that's the best of both worlds. What if a party refuses an advisor? This happens, believe it or not. Um, some some parties think, you know, listen, I, I can't remember the night. I have nothing to say. Um, you know, I'm sure that what the complainant or the other party is saying is true. Um, you know, there, there are these cases where, where people just don't want an advisor. Um, best practices here, um, when a, when a person tells you, a party tells you that they do not want an advisor and you're offering to provide one to them from your list that you have, um, you really want to get that student to sign off and say, you know, I know the benefits of having an advisor. You know, it's been explained to me what the advisor's role is. It's been explained to me what the investigative process is, what the hearing looks like, you know, that I'm I'm open to informal resolution, that that's a possibility if the other party wants to engage in it. Um, so you really, you want to have something in writing from that party saying that they don't want an advisor. Of course, if the case goes to a hearing, the school must provide an advisor for purposes of cross-examination. And believe it or not, even in this day and age, I have had a case where the school did not provide an advisor for the hearing. Um, the student was not able to ask any questions on cross-examination because there was no advisor to perform that cross-examination. And that's such a detriment to due process. That's never a situation that a school you know, wants to find itself in um, looking back and regretting the fact that they did not, you know, provide that advisor. So again, it's really just informing the student what the role of the advisor is, explaining that even if you're turning down an advisor now, you are going to be, you know, if we get to a full hearing, that you are going to have one appointed, there will be someone there. Um, and so the benefit of really just getting that advisor involved early on so that that advisor, you know, can partake and, and understand what the record and the investigative report is before the actual hearing itself. Of course, there, there is additional support um, available on campus. So the advocates can be serving as an additional support person, victim assistance, wellness, student life can all also provide support. Um, and this really is so important to ensure the mental health um, assistance of parties going through this process, complainants, respondents. I mean, it, it's just such a stressful process for everyone. Um, and it really is, it, it's good to have these professionals handling, you know, the emotional support of the parties as opposed to the advisor. The advisor, as you can see, already has a huge role um, to play within this process. Um, and and these, these particular professionals can work, you know, in tandem with the advisors, but that they're trained you know, in the policies and procedures and to, to really walk the students through that mental health support. Now that you have your team and your list and unfortunately cases coming in, you know, what are we gonna do um, to keep the team together? And, you know, number one should be communication. Um, you know, we're gonna be providing all the training that we just talked about, um, but then communicate consistently with your team, you know, letting them know that, you know, you're working through some things. These are some trends that are happening. Um, that kind of thing is really important um, 
because sometimes people are on the list and they don't get called on and they're like, well, why did I do this? Uh, and when they start to say, why do I do this? You're going to need them. And so to keep that communication going is really important. The, the other piece is that clear expectation and letting them know that they're not going to be alone in this process, that you're going to be checking in with them throughout um, and making sure that you're also taking into consideration, you know, how the case may be impacting them, right? So in this work, we're also impacted. And so that's that best practice, again, to have a support person in the room, as well as the advisor is really, really important if, if your policy will allow for that. Um, yeah. So the other thing is that, you know, what does this sort of look like moving forward, right? Um, so you have all this, you, you scheduled your training, you've put your communication plan in place, you're assigning um, your advisors to your cases, but what are you doing daily as a Title IX coordinator to ensure that your advisors are doing uh, the work that you're asking them to do? And number one is to be checking in with them. Um, I think that's part of you know that term coordination in our uh, titles is to make sure that things are going as smoothly as possible for the student, for the institution, um, and, and making sure that the advisors are clear on things. So there might be something that comes up while they're doing investigative, sitting in the room during the investigative process that they might not have heard before. So it, to provide them an opportunity to sort of check in with you. Um, and then obviously prepping for the hearing is going to be also a really important thing for you to do with someone, especially if it's their first case. Um, there are advisors that I've had doing this work for a, a longer period of time that I can say, okay, you got it. And just do a brief check-in versus a, a less seasoned advisor where I'm sitting with them a little longer. And so just making sure that you schedule time to do that um, is super important. Um, the only other thing that I, you know, say is that the, one of the best things to do is to thank people, right? So, oh yeah, the case is done and you don't do anything, but to kind of give that, um, you know, thank you so much. You did a great job. And, you know, what does those semesterly meetings look like? And maybe you can come up with, you know, some, some type of giveaway to give them to make them feel special. Like that stuff does matter. Um, and it will allow for them to, to stay on for a longer period of time. Um, but the Title IX process does not work without strong advisors. And so these folks are really, really key uh, to the success of, of your cases. Allison, you had said, you know, you typically do one to two year, you know, timeframes. Are there any term limits you impose? You know, hey, you've been serving for eight years. Now you're out. <laughs> I, I wish I had that luxury. <laughs> 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 if you're at an institution that has a, a list with folks on it for that, I want to talk to you because I want to know what's going on, you know, <laughs> what the secret is there. Um, you know, just folks that didn't choose to get into this work doing the advisor role, you're hearing a lot of things that you would not normally hear, and it is heavy stuff. And so um, I, I think that the, you know, two-year max is, is good for everybody. Okay. Do you, do you also remind advisors of their own you know, mental well-being and that they can check in, you know, with with college um, health and services if they need to. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's something for, you know, for everyone on the call to know what your institution does provide to employees so that you have that in case, you know, maybe they hear something's triggered, right? There's a memory triggered or their own personal um, experience may come to the forefront that they need to to work on. And so to have that information um, available to help support the advisor themselves is very, very important. Mm -hmm. I do think we have a question though, Ash. Oh, yes. <laughs> so the question is, is it the responsibility of the advisor or the party they are advising to come up with the questions? I'm assuming this is for the live hearing that this is a reference to. Um, I have found in my experience that it's both, it's a joint effort. Um, you know, the advisor needs to let the person, the party know, um, you know, what to expect, that there will be cross-examination questions, that they will be cross-examined, um, but they'll, they'll also have the opportunity, you know, to, to think of their own questions for the other party. And so usually that that's a joint effort between the advisor and the party to come up with those questions ahead of time. Um, but a lot of times it's, it's things that come up at the hearing that you, you know, you may be hearing, um, for the first time based upon, you know, other questions 
asked and answered. And so it's it's more fluid than that. But I think going into the hearing, you know, advisors want to be prepared and have some sort of an outline of questions of what they would like asked at that hearing. So if anyone has any additional questions, definitely put them in the Q&A box. Um, while we're waiting to see if there are any more, though, we do want to talk to you a little bit about an event we have coming up. Ashling, are you going to talk about this? Yeah, go for it, Sydney. Oh, OK, great. <laughs> Um, if anyone is in the Philadelphia area or anywhere um, with easy Amtrak service, we will be hosting a Title IX today and tomorrow discussion, meet and greet, very informally at Mainstay Independent Brewing Company in Philadelphia on April 17th from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, this will be a time to talk about, you know, what's working now, what do you hope works differently, better in the future. Um, and it will have some informal discussion at the beginning, but a huge part of this will be a way for different uh, Title IX stakeholders to meet and to talk about what's working and what what maybe isn't working. What do we want to work on changing for the future? So if you are in the vicinity, we'd love to see you. Definitely. Uh, a big thank you to all for coming today, especially Allison for co-presenting with us. Always appreciate you here and um, hope everyone has a good day. Please reach out if you have any questions. Take care.